and yeah, I just appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, I'm curious because I know that in 1998, uh, Dr. Bob Ballard led an expedition of scientists and Japanese Midway veterans, um, and they were able to locate the wreckage um, of USS Yorktown. Um, and I know that they located and photographed the ship, um, but what parts of the ship were seen during that expedition? Bridge, nap. It's a good question, and one of the things that we're looking at right now is we have Dr. Ballard's book in which he reports the, the results of that mission. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of things that I think are noteworthy about Dr. Ballard's mission. First and foremost is, of course, that they did find Yorktown and were able to dive to it and bring that vessel back into the modern day uh, through that, but also by bringing veterans out. And he had two American and two Japanese veterans with him. Mm. The other part of that mission in addition to sharing it, was documenting the vessel. Unfortunately, they were plagued with equipment problems that Dr. Ballard explains. Mm -hmm. uh, technology's changed dramatically in terms of the work we do undersea, but even now, as many of us know, this, this strange marriage of salt water and electronics is often a troubled one. So yeah. with that, it's the more often than not, we, we always face you know operational difficulties, and that extends in space as well. The space race has certainly been marked by all sorts of mishaps with equipment and occasionally with loss of life. Uh, so with that, Dr. Ballard's team did not get a full suite of documentation of Yorktown. What they got was powerful imagery and, and some powerful connections to the past. With that, and thanks to the magic of artist Ken Marshall, took that data and created a series of powerful documentary paintings of Yorktown. What we're now able to do on this mission is to get a more comprehensive set of images and views. We're seeing things in some cases for the very first time that were thought to be there but which were not able to be captured photographically back in 1998. But I also want to point out that back then Dr. Ballard and the team on the ship did not have the benefit of the type of satellite connectivity to the rest of the world that we're all experiencing now. And the magic of the telepresence Dr. Ballard had advocated for and in creating the Ocean Exploration Trust carries us back down to the point we are now. We're able to communicate and share this as colleagues both on ship and shore, but with scientists and, co and other colleagues around the world, but also importantly with everybody around the world in the public who's joining us. And that is a very powerful aspect, not only of ocean exploration, but also in terms of connecting us to the oceans and to the heritage, uh, the common human heritage that the oceans represent. Thank you, Dr. Ballard. Thank you, Ocean Exploration Trust. And thank you, Noah. Amazing. Thank you so much for that response. And I uh, want to uplift everything that you said about the power of telepresence and the fact that we have viewers joining us right now, um, viewing this scene with us. Um, as it is so special, and we really want to honor um, the lives that were lost during this battle um, and bring everyone with us and just seeing everything. Um, is anyone able to speak on the work and the collaboration that took place since that first expedition in 1998 to make this happen today? Well, that, that's a good idea, but I just want to ask Real quick, our shoreside team, Jim, you know, further aft, we were looking at hull that was almost pristine. And and here, I'm looking at this uh, hull plate, and the texture is very different. And it's almost, uh, is that buckling? Is that warping? What do you, what do you think you see here? There's it's some a good question, Hans. And as I'm looking at this, I'm... I'm looking back at other wrecks that we've uh, we've explored in deep water and it comes back to a discussion earlier in the dives many hours ago as Yorktown was damaged on the surface certainly there are photographs some of them grainy that give us a sense of what happened we have the after action report captain buckmaster's report talking about torpedo hit near this frame bomb hit here and drawings of that what we've gained through that is a better sense now for the archaeology of exactly what that damage looks like. But that doesn't get us to what we are seeing now, and I see it because you've actually got 
uh, whole plating that is, is more it's almost like shrink wrapped up against the frames. What this suggests to me is that the violence of the sinking in Yorktown falling rapidly through the water as a hydrodynamic hull still flooded, uh, in some cases with compartments imploding because the water hadn't completely gotten into them as it fell and the pressure built. But with that, pushing things back, starting to compress some of those plates. And we see the type of damage on other deep water ships. We certainly saw it uh, as well with Titanic because the bow did that same thing. And as any of us who've been to Titanic know, the impact of that hull driving into the seabed was such that it plowed the bottom up and the forward hatch cover flew off, struck the forward anchor davit, dented itself on that, and then moved forward. That's the, that's the, that's the impact. So I think we're seeing a bit of all of that. And as you can see now, what we're also beginning to get a sense of is how much more the bow is, is buried in the sediment, and I think we'll see that further as we move forward. Again, and this is something that we wouldn't know and you wouldn't see unless you're down here on the bottom, three and a half miles down, and looking at what happens when Yorktown transitioned from ship to shipwreck. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, we have seen compression like that in various wrecks uh, in deep water. We've seen hull plate, you know, bend in, warp. It just seems like the texture is quite different from the things we saw aft. It'll be interesting to see what it looks like a little forward further on. I just a, a shout out to Dr. Ballard, who may be watching. And, you know, Bob, if you're out there, we've talked about this in the past. Uh, knowing that the systems, you know, back then struggled with these type of extreme depths, and this is one of the deepest missions. I mean, we're, we're going into depths that we never thought would be possible. Titanic was incredibly deep, and it's a mile shallower than where we are now. Um, the systems didn't work. We still got some great stuff. But Bob in his book said that uh, the images we salvaged will almost surely be the only ones ever taken of this noble shipwreck. Well, two decades later, with new technology, with Nautilus and with all of us, uh, Dr. Ballard has helped convene to bring us all back to get those additional images that were not possible back in 1998. Uh, again, a reminder, um, as we've also seen in the repairs made to the ship to keep it afloat and to keep, it, and in the, pers the perseverance of both sides in fighting the battle, there's nothing quite like the human spirit that drives us forward and how appropriate as we assess a battle and the scene of a battle and loss of life that we also have an opportunity to reflect on what happens with that human spirit is focused in the cause of exploration and learning. I'm starting to get some reflections in the sonar, and it almost seems on the uh, path we're traveling. I'm going to turn the vehicle a little to the left to just take a look. Okay. Material was jettisoned, including guns, but that may have, that was further back, but. There may be structure that came off. We're particularly interested in aircraft. I see nothing over there. I'm going to bring it back. Thank you so much for sharing those perspectives. You know, from an oceanic perspective, the ocean connects us all. Oftentimes people think the ocean divides us, but in reality, it connects us all. And as we look at Hawaii, in the middle of Moana Nui Akea, the Pacific, and we have Japan, and we have um, America, you know, that ocean touches all of our shores. And so we're just grateful to be here at this moment in time to be able to explore, to use history, to look at history and use it to inform our present and our future. 
history has such so much to teach all of us about how to work collectively and collaboratively across our different um, oceans and shorelines. So we're happy that everybody who's been able to join us today is here. You know, we're looking at something that people have not seen before and uh, human eyes have not seen. So it's a very historic moment in time and a historic dive. And we're happy you're all here to join us. Still right here. Nav, are we in the middle of a ship move? Yes, uh, we're about almost halfway there. Okay, thanks. Sure. May not feel like it, but we're moving. Yeah, well, I, ju I just ran to the restroom. I'm not sure why the hull back at the stern just looked so much more white and this looks like yeah. blue it might be the change in the iris or distance from the hull or Yeah, we're kind of far uh, uh, far, far off. Yeah. Right now. Uh sonar showing about 12 meters. Yep. Okay. Hey, Mike, would this be a good time for me to try some uh, adjustments on our video? Right now that we're a little far away from the hole and not looking at anything critical. So. Uh, science. Uh, yeah, if you, yeah, okay. if you need to. Just want to try. Uh, it's too far. me to use the laterals to try and get just a wee bit closer? Sorry, I missed that. What was that? Oh, uh, would you like me to use the laterals to try and get a wee bit closer? Oh, sure. Yeah, that gives us a, a better view. Thank you. Nautilus, this is Shore Party. Just to let you know, uh, we received a very Nice photograph of Dr. Ballard watching us all and sending us his best. That's great to hear. Thanks, Jim. So, Mike, I'm able to dial some of the blue out, but I'm a little concerned that this will um, affect a difference in what you were seeing before and what you're seeing now. You know what I mean? We could just continue. I look bluer. I just brought the blue back in. I had it down up around here. Um, that looks good there. Yeah, but it does make our imagery from previous in the dive inconsistent with this point oh. forward. So if you're comparing colors. Yeah, well, there's nothing wrong with it. I was just noting the difference. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to put 
So we send out our aloha to Dr. Ballard from the control van on board the Nautilus. And continue shooting in a consistent manner. And then in post, we'll clean all this up. Looks like there's about 10 meters left in this move for the vehicle. Yeah, why don't you put in another call so we just keep moving? Okay. Thanks. Sure. Uh, yeah, I'll just keep the same bearing. Yep. Do another ship move, 35 meters at bearing 35. Thank you. So for those of you just joining us, we are on Expedition NA-154, Ala Aumuana Kaiuli, the path of the deep sea traveler. So Ala, the Hawaiian word, if we break down the, the name of the expedition, Ala means a path. Aumuana is to travel on the open sea. Kai is the Hawaiian word for sea and uli, it's a special color of blue that you'll find in the deep ocean. So ala aumawana kai uli that is occurring in Papa Hanaumokua Kea Marine National Monument. Welcome to all of you. Thanks for joining us. Want to get back to the bow and come right up the stem? Yeah, I want to, um, like at the bow, I want to scan outward and mm -hmm. just see if there's a sonar target out there that we thought we saw on mm -hmm. the way out. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, yeah, we'll come up the stem and, and go down the flight deck. And uh, should I come up a little bit, give us a better view of the, uh, the hull and above, or are we mm -hmm. interested in the uh, yeah, transition? Yeah, I mean, we're. we're yeah, we're interested in the transition if there's any debris, um, but we can come up a little bit and uh, see a little bit more. There's also, just note above us, there's like uh, some gun tubs, so I don't want to get too close over there, but I think we're okay. I think those that's there with them right there. Like those gun tubs overhang the exterior of the hull, there's some support or something, we'll see. Is that right? Yeah, that looks good. We're still at the hangar door? Big door no, right I there. I think we're back here. Well, that's good. We would have passed them then. Yeah. Like here. You're welcome. Hannah's over here like, where are the rocks? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I was looking at, um, <laughs> I was looking at the seafloor. <laughs> at the what? 
at the at the seafloor, I couldn't help oh, it. Oh yeah, you're like oh mud. Yeah. Hey, this is Tito in the front row. I got to throw a shout out to Kathy Offinger. Uh, just wouldn't wouldn't be normal doing this without you watching somewhere. <laughs> Many of these have been talked about for so many years, so um, I personally appreciate that shout out. Thank you. Yeah. So, Nautilus team, the things that we're looking at here and trying to get a sense of, and I'm curious what you are thinking, it, it almost appears to us that not only does Yorktown have this list that goes over to uh, to starboard, but that the bow seems to be buried deeper in the sediment. Yeah. Uh, and so with that, it's it's leaning it's forward as if it plowed in like Titanic's bow did, but also on on that lift. And coming back to the damage that we saw earlier on the dive, where the support for the flight deck forward appears to have buckled, and there's that that area where it's fallen. Yeah. That would be the low point in the gravity and a logical breaking point for that if that's the case. So uh, it's a far more complex sort of rest point of rest for the ship than we'd initially thought, I think. Yeah, it seems like it it was canted over to to starboard as it plowed in and then kind of stuck in that position. Uh, but the whole, I mean, the whole thing is buried at least to the water line at the stern and, and much deeper at the bow. It's like it never fully righted itself right. in the water column. It fell three and a half miles. It stayed lifted. Yeah. But it did it did tend to shallow or b bottom out a bit. Otherwise, it would have it would have hit. At yeah, a, because it's saying oh, yeah. for the stern yeah. was or no the uh, I'm sorry the bow was sticking straight up as it sank. At one point. Do we have an idea of how quickly the York? town sank uh, well it sank over uh, overnight it, uh, is is how long it took to settle in the water and then it capsized and sank the next morning after it was torpedoed as to how long it took to fall through the water column we'd have to leave that to somebody else there's been a fair deal of that type of computation done Mike who was it that we were recently talking to that had been calculating that? Um, was oh, it I don't Rob remember. Or was it... We were trying it to answer that Rob earlier. Church. I think it may have been Rob Church. Uh, oh, okay. Who was looking at that just in terms of, but it would have sunk. It wouldn't have taken a long time for it to hit the bottom. Thank you for that. That was a question from one of our viewers. But I mean, to that end, I mean, people need to know, I mean, we should share how long it took for the robot to get down to Yorktown. The descent was slower than the ship sank, but it still took hours. Over four hours. Coming back to that point, though, I mean, Yorktown, we you know now have the sense was still over on its side and sinking, but it sank at an angle, and that angle carried it further underwater. It continued to sail on, even flooded and falling, uh, some distance away from where it left the surface because it sank in the dark. We don't know exactly where that was, but ultimately, in calculating it out. Uh, and I know that there's somebody out there that would be doing this. And maybe Rob's out there watching this right now and calculating how long it would take to fall. But it's these kinds of forensics that are important for us because the more of this we figure out from known sinking sites and where a vessel comes to rest, say like Titanic, for example, uh, it helps for future work when we're searching for wrecks and we're doing our surveys. 
you draw a survey box to search, and uh, this helps us refine the size of those boxes. That's not lettering. So watch lead this now. With the moves we've already put in, I think it's going to be about uh, five meters shy of point two or the port two um, marker and high pack. Okay. Um, so we probably don't want to go much beyond that. For uh. Oh, no, no, that's fine. Yeah, I want to kind of stop there and then use the scanning sonar to look around a little bit. Okay, and so how you, close were you to the bow? At point, we were at point. the bow. That is the bow. Yeah, okay. So we don't want to be closer to the south towards the ship than that. Correct, yeah. Hey, hey ship, and any chance we could take a, just a quick zoom on that bit? Just like in the aftermost boundary of the shot, I'm sort of curious, just to make sure that there's no there's no writing on the hull, just underneath that one bit. Yeah, I think I saw that earlier. It looked like Charlie Romeo. I think those are biological, but they're just to our right, Tito. Can we uh, rotate to starboard? Coming around. Say what? Keep going just at the edge of frame right now. I'm looking at the fair leads. I don't see the bit. I, I think yeah, I it's a fair lead. Uh, oh, it right looks there. like a 40. Yeah, it keeps it's, going up. Yeah, right in there, right there where they just circled. Thank you. That's looks good. like a four it's zero. Very, uh, I might need a tilt or to come up a little bit. I'm coming up a bit. Yeah. Maybe and I'm going to zoom at the same time. Try and focus. Uh, my zooms run away. Huh. Um. Yeah. That's a little four zero. Hard to see. Yeah. Yeah, we thought we made out letters at the stern, but it, surprisingly, the, the motion makes it more difficult to uh, Let me brighten this. I like that. Oh, I'm so. full up, all the way up. And, um, yeah, uh, ship, we can disregard. I mean, it's, yep. it's not worth any extra effort. I'm not, I'm hands off. And I just had a runaway zoom too. Coming back out. All right, let me know when you want to bring the heading back to where we That's were. That's full wide. Out. Yeah, go ahead. Were you having this issue before, Mike? No. No. All right, I'm going to put in auto iris. And back into manual. Okay, I'm going to have some noise in my potentiometer here. And coming back down a bit.
And that's down around 14 meters at altitude. I'm thinking we might want to come up a couple of meters yeah, for a I better think, view. Yeah, I think so. I wonder if we tilt up, if we could be bouncing the light off the oh, mud. Oh, might use the light a little better. Yeah. Jack, you want to tilt up just a wee bit? Tilt up? Yeah, if, right if we don't move the vehicle up and ha still have the lights pointed at the mud, I just want to try a quick zoom here to see if that gives us a better result. I know we're not zooming for most of this, I just want to see if that helps. Try and use the bottom as a reflector. <clears throat> so that's the bat right there, isn't it? Yeah. Right. About 15 meters off. Yeah, and I'd like to come up just a wee bit more. Yeah, please do. I was actually going to have us come up a little bit. And we've got the gun tubs there, and then there's the flight deck. Cool. Would you um would you uh spin just maybe like ninety degrees to the left? All right. Just uh, for a scanning sonar scan. Roger that. Turning ninety left. Yeah, I mean, there's a little blip, but I don't see like a solid target like we saw earlier. I, I you think wanna, you want to come down a bit. Yeah, maybe. All right, coming down. I'm at 21 meters now. I'll come down to whatever okay. you like. Um, let's go to like 15. Roger that. Hmm. All right, that's around 15 meters altitude. Yeah, it's just that little tiny blip. I don't know if it's worth checking out. What do you guys think? I thought it was more prominent than that the first time we yeah, saw it. Yeah, I thought so too, but it might have just been, you know, yeah. noise or something. Mike, just given this whole question of forward momentum and anything being projected off of it, I, we're down here. It shouldn't take too long. I'd okay. say go take a look. Anyway, yeah. we've been, that's how that forward hatch cover from Titanic. Came yeah, Roger that. Derek, can we um, maybe try to zero in on that and move us over there if possible? It's uh, about 38 meters in front of us, due north. Um, if that's the blip you were talking about. I'm looking at, well, now it's gone entirely. I mean, it was like cursor to go up to where I saw no, it, right, right around here. I know it's to the left. It right. just passed it's just it. Just right over here, Tito. I don't know if you can. Okay, yeah. There's that. Yeah. That's the one I the was thinking. Yeah, the other one is to is all the way to the left. Uh, down, 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 down. Yeah, down, down, that. Down, down. Wolf. That's what I was looking at. And why don't I bring the heading over that way? Yeah, sounds good. And that's about 60 degrees.
I don't know. Seems to have vanished. Isn't it straight in front of us now? Should be. Yeah, bearing, uh, let's see, right around 310. Like right there. Yeah, well, let's go take a look anyway. Yeah, that's it there. Yep. Uh, it's going to take probably 10 or 15 minutes. Understood. Seriously. Yeah. And then same back. We have the bow of the ship. So Mike, after that, Just turn camera. Mike, after that, are we then intending to fly over the flight so, deck? Yes. Look into so the elevator? We went about 20 yep. meters in that direction. That's uh, safe. You know, why don't we go 25? Uh, so right now it's showing about, yeah, between 37 and 42, 43. Yeah, a good solid 25, 28 meters will put us uh, in that range. All right, 25 meters bearing 310. Uh, yes. And may I turn the uh, Atalanta back to the carrier for the time being? Bridge nav. I'd like to do a ship move, please. 25 meters at bearing 310. Correct, thank you. What is that? Oh. The bow again. Yeah. And I'm just going to come gotcha. up just a wee bit. All of the Ohana, the families who had um, service member on board the Yorktown or within the Battle of Midway, um, we just want to uh, mahalo and thank all of those who offered the ultimate in sacrifice and service and who gave their lives um, during this time. So we thank all of those who have joined us online through our live stream, who have a deep connection to this wreckage or for those whose uh, family members, their ohana, served in the military forces during World War II. One thing is strange, I mean, we saw such a difference and thought we saw the flight deck picked up on the port side and postulated that the, there was some collapse on the starboard side, but, you know, the pillars don't look like anything is wrong with them. It could have been a trick of perspective, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, it could have been the angle you're looking at it, could have been just yeah, I mean, it might be difficult to tell that the bow itself is at an angle because it's so pointed. Yeah.
Earlier it was mentioned uh, how long it took for our ROV Atalanta to reach the step. And currently we are sitting at about 5,149 meters beneath the sea uh, surface. And I just want to recognize how incredible it is that we have this technology to reach these depths. And for our longtime viewers, you may be noticing that right now we are diving only with Atalanta, our tow sled ROV. Um, and usually we are operating with a dual body system with ROV Atalanta and ROV Hercules. Um, and I wanted to ask our navigator right now, Derek, uh, do you have a second to share a little bit with our viewers about how diving only with Atalanta is impacting how fast we're moving down here at the step? Uh, sure, yeah. So um, basically to visualize kind of our setup right now, the ship obviously on the surface, and then we have a, ca uh, a steel cable coming off the back, um, which is holding the vehicle. Um, and so you can think of that as, as almost like a long, <laughs> somewhat flexible pole going down through the water column. Um, and the vehicle's right at the end of that. So we kind of have to move the whole ship to reposition the vehicle relative to the wreck. Uh, and it takes, if you can picture uh, translating the motion of a ship moving 35 meters at the surface all the way down to where we are now at 5,150 uh, meters deep, it takes quite a while to translate all that motion down through a cable and actually uh, move the vehicle over to where we're trying to get it to. Um, normally when we're diving with the, the two-body system with Hercules uh, connected from a, with a tether to that uh, Atalanta vehicle at the end of the cable, um, you can th kind of think of it more as like a, uh, a dog at the end of a, a leash tied to a pole. Okay, so the the tether is like a leash and it, the vehicle is free to move kind of within that distance uh, on its own and look around and investigate. So it's far more maneuverable um, and can get uh, closer to things more safely and with less ship motion translated into it. Um, so that's why when you, you see our imagery today, you'll notice there's a little bit of uh, up and down motion because we're directly attached to the cable and normally Hercules is a little bit removed from that motion um, because it's connected to Atalanta with a tether. Um, so yeah, a little, little, we've got to be a little more cautious. All the movements we make are translated much slower um, to what you're seeing on the screen. So hopefully that gives a little bit of sense of the difference there. Yeah, thank you, Derek. That was a great explanation, and I also wanted to uh, just recognize the hard work of our ROV team on board the ship um, and having them get us down here to this depth. It's really incredible that we're down here and that we're able to share this with all of our viewer live, viewers live right now. All right, I'm going to bring the heading back around to our course over ground. Yeah, sounds good. And so right now, uh, the, sh the ship movement and the movement uh, that we're translating down to the vehicles sort of stepping a bit away from the main wreck, and we're looking to go investigate um, something that we we saw on the sonar that's mounted on the vehicle. And I'm going to come back down to around 12 meters of altitude. If any of our viewers are interested in learning more about the voices that you're hearing and the people that we've got right now um, on watch in the control van and on shore joining us, um, if you head over to the Nautilus site, you can see all of our team members listed. And we all have bios and pictures that you can read to just kind of get a better idea of the experience that people are bringing to the table. And also on our nautiluslive.org site, you can send us in questions, comments, just responses to what 
we're all seeing right now. So I just wanted to make sure if we had any viewers on YouTube that you knew that this was an option as well. Kind of looks like uh, it's still pinging just maybe on sand ripples that are out there. Or is there something on the ground there? I think we're just looking at sediment, honestly. Because it doesn't look like the pings are any closer to us than they were, right? Keep in mind, sometimes we get artifacts from the sonar. Well, that's what I'm thinking it might have been, yeah. Uh, just from like the vehicle itself. Yeah. If it, yeah. We, those those variations tend to be um, as the pings return. Well, yeah, that, 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 that's what I meant is that it's just kind of not really seeing anything that's real. Yeah. Um, why don't we turn around and come back? It's worth checking out anyway. Make some adjustments to color while we're away from the uh, vessel. So the next step is we're going to um, come up over the bow to the flight deck and uh, we're going to do a full length of the ship along the flight deck. We'll pause at the uh, at the bridge in the stack and do a, a, a survey of, of what that looks like from the interior of the inside of the ship side we already got the the outside of it uh, on uh, our our descent okay normal I'm just going to drop a marker before we move there. Yep. I don't know about the water today. Hey, uh, uh, my quick thought from uh, from shore. Uh, you know, I'm not sure if this is possible, but given that ostensibly it would be just a vertical movement if we're centered on the bridge, do you think we potentially could take a a vertical, vertical path, one path up the tower with hopes to model that data later? Um, you mean do like a, a, a full coverage mosaic uh, survey of the tower, of the stack? I mean, it, it wouldn't have to be full since we probably, I don't know if we'd want to take time to circumnavigate it, but we could at least get well, I mean, like, a one side of it. Yeah, we could at least, like, ortho mosaic one side, the inner side of it, if we're going down the flight deck and take a look at the bridge, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, we could give that a shot. So, how does that translate into what we want to do? Uh, uh, doesn't change anything yet. So, we need to um, come up over the bow, do a similar tract you know, 30 meter movement line down the back, down the flight deck. We're going to observe damage to the deck as we go. Uh, when we get to the stack, I want to do first an initial look at it to make sure that there's nothing scary there, like the collapsed tripod or whatever, um, and make sure that it's something we can do. I don't know if we're going to do the whole thing because it's kind of large, but um, <clears throat> at that point, we'll basically set the camera the lighting and the zoom at what we want and then kind of go back and forth um left to right right to left left to right oh, as we go up maybe like two meters at a time something like that so that we get overlapping coverage in the video that we can run through a, a software to get a, an ortho mosaic from it and then we'll finish the survey of the flight deck to the stern okay so for now, first thing we want to do is just get back as close to the bow as we can, right at the front yep. of the ship. Yep.
bridge nav. Like to call in a new ship move of 30 meters at bearing 115. Thank you. So we have a viewer that's wondering if this is the first time that any of us have been part of uh, a dive over a shipwreck and I know for me that this is uh, my very first experience and I'm just sitting in the control van just in total awe of everything that we're seeing um, and awe of the technology, just the fact that we're right now this deep with ROV Atlanta and that we're seeing everything and sharing it with you all and also just in awe of all of the collaboration and recognizing that this is a resting place for so many, so many loved ones, and uh, I wanted to ask anyone in here with me now, or any of our uh, scientists ashore, what has your experience been like? Have you been, have you been part of a dive before with other shipwrecks? I know some of you definitely have in here. Yeah. I think there's a number of folks, I mean, all told, I mean, on the ship with you, you know, uh, Dr. Van Tilburg has certainly been on a, a range of dives, many World War II sites and others, including the Fukushu Senkotai, or the, the smaller site Japanese submarines used in the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, Hans and I were working with the University of Hawaii dives on the I-400, larger Sentoku, uh, as well as the former USS. Uh, Kailua, the Dickinson, a, whole, a wide range of other sites. Some of us have dived at Pearl Harbor on Arizona. Uh, a number of deep dives, of course, both with ocean exploration trust and NOAA. Uh, Dr. Brennan has been on a, a wide range of dives that he could certainly talk about. Uh, so we, many of us have done a, a large number. Some of us are also veterans of work on Titanic and other deep water sites. The, just the one simple answer, not, and I'm not going to speak for everybody, but I'll just say for myself, people often ask, what's the most fascinating shipwreck you've seen? And they all have their stories and they're all fascinating. Is there a favorite? Actually, uh, my answer is always, it's the next one, because it's an opportunity to learn. It's something new. It makes you reflect about that which you've seen before and to gain new perspectives on that which you've seen. And in that, a reminder that uh, for all of us, even though I've been at this, I've been working in this field now for 45 years, and I'm, I'm still learning. And isn't that fun? And isn't that magic? And isn't that what you would, you would hope for in a career? I mean, I'm, I'm, I feel very lucky. Uh, this is Tito in the front row. I've been uh, fortunate enough to have worked with Dr. Ballard a few times in the past. Uh, the first time was as a crew member on the RV Nora when we found the Titanic back in 1985. I was the uh, mess attendant, and I can't tell you the sense of awe watching the television screen from the main lab. But then again in 2000, finding the third century shipwreck in the anoxic layer of the Black Sea was just seeing that mast appear out of nowhere was one of the most magical things I've ever seen on the ocean bottom. Wow, thank you both so much for sharing. Um, that was just so powerful to listen to, and I know our viewers at home um, also maybe feel the same way, and I just am still just in awe that we're experiencing this all together and that we have so many people following along with us. Thank you both. One of the remarkable things about this multidisciplinary mission is that, uh, yeah, there are a number of us that have been on, on a number of shipwreck projects, 
This is by far the deepest one that I've ever mm -hmm. seen, of course. But I can tell you this, this is the first mission I've been on where I've seen an ascent of an underwater seamount and learned the names of some of the species on the way up. Mm -hmm. So the learning that happens on board Nautilus is uh, a benefit to all of us. For the natural scientists, the biologists and geologists, you get to experience some archaeology. And for us history nuts, to get to experience the natural wonders of the seamounts and Papahanao Makuakea Marine National Monument. It's been pretty special so far. Hans, that just reminds me that a few years back, uh, Nautilus was on the west coast off north of San Francisco working in Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary. And we were diving on a wreck, a ship that had struck the rocks and sunk in relatively shallow water, a few hundred feet compared to, you know, the, the three and a half miles that we're at now. And again, this was being broadcast. And one of the most magic comms that we got coming back to the ship was from a, a, some folks who sent in the chat that they were watching the dive and were that was that ship just offshore and away from their out Nautilus. And it was. And and that's a reminder that yeah, you can go out into the middle of the ocean to Papahanao Mukuakea and, and see some important and powerful wrecks like this. But discovery, exploration and discovery also happen in your own backyard. Literally. And that that's magic in and by itself. Thank you for sharing that. That's so important, especially for our youth, as they think about, you know, keeping that, that um, curiosity and passion about the natural world and history alive within our uh, younger generations. So I feel so strongly that, you know, um, opportunities like this with telepresence, with exploration, um, with you know, discovering things that people have not seen before is so important. And hopefully we've got some youth uh, watching our live stream and um, perhaps seeing themselves as future explorers. Well, not to put too fine a point on it, but everybody that's watching now with us we're seeing this at the same time you are, and you're seeing it at the same time we are. So you are explorers. You are seeing this for the first time with the rest of us. And for those of you who write in and share your observations, you're part of it. Thank you. I think when we made the move to come back in this direction, the vehicle was still sort of on a pendulum in the other way, so it's taken a while to come back towards the... Uh, okay, understood, yeah, that makes sense. We'll be patient. The Yorktown's been there 81 years. We can take a few moments to get back to the bow. And it's closing up on the sonar. Speaking of years, Hans, um, there are still, I believe there's still two veterans of the Battle of Midway that are still um, alive. And I think um, maybe it was uh, two years ago, they flew 
several, I think there were three of them that were at the time alive and they brought them back to um, Midway and they did a wonderful um, celebration and collaboration of um, this historic event that occurred during World War II. And I had an um, opportunity to speak with one of the veterans who was in his 90s. And, you know, just the joy of living and, um, you know, scarred by battle, but still able to um, be happy about living each day and waking up every morning and um, being able to live his life. So it was such an inspiration for me to meet these um, three gentlemen and um, the camaraderie that they show, you know, amongst himself after going through um, such, uh, you know, traumatic events. Mm -hmm. But they in themselves were just inspiring to fly across, you know, the continental USA and across the Pacific to return to commemorate this event. Were they at Midway? They went to Midway. They first came into Honolulu um, and were hosted by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and then went to Midway. That is such a remarkable place. You know, it has so many complex layers of history. I really didn't appreciate that until the first time I went there and began to realize what it all meant. It, of course, it has the deep cultural time of the Hawaiian past and present. And it has the uh, the remains of the, the cable station, Trans-Pacific Cable, in 1903, mm -hmm. that transmitted first in 1903, <laughs> you know, the messages. And the, some of the remnants of the Pan American Clipper building, mm -hmm. when they were doing the five-day cross-Pacific flying boat flights in the 1930s, it has all the World War II history of Midway and the attack, but then beyond that, it has the history of the 50s, 60s, and 70s during the Cold War when it was part of the distant early warning line with daily flights up to the Aleutian Islands in our pre-satellite days and our kind of standoff with um, the Soviet Union. And now, thankfully, it's returned to a more peaceful nature, mm -hmm. and through all of it, those Goonie birds are still there. The albatross are still there. They sure doing are. Doing what they do, and the seabirds are still there, and the marine life, and, and the sharks are you, all You've mentioned still albatrosses there. multiple times. I think you might have a vendetta. I, uh, <laughs> they're wonderful and comical and very impressive birds. And make you break ribs. They, I did, I, the, the bird was unhurt, and I suffered a And Hans rib. was not unhurt. Right. <laughs> Yeah, so Midway actually hosts um, over a million seabirds that make their home on this um, atoll, which is the second most northerly atoll in the world. Mm -hmm. um, Midway's uh, name, its Hawaiian name, is Kuai Helani, and um, is really important in Hawaiian um, oral narratives and mo'olelo that have been passed down through the generations. So Midway is a fairly contemporary name. Its original um, name is Kuai Helani. I want to practice saying the name. You said it was Kuai. Yep, so Kuai Helani. Helani. Nice, thank you. And as we're exploring um, you know, with our modern technology, um, we acknowledge um, the Polynesian voyagers, um, probably the greatest navigators in the world who voyaged across Moana Nui Akea, the Pacific Ocean, and uh, expanded across the ocean and uh, spread a wonderful culture um, that thrived on the most isolated archipelago in the world. So we here in Papahanaumokuakea, we manage our resources, our natural resources as cultural resources and have a very unique um, management system that includes um, four partner agencies or trustees that include NOAA, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, the State of Hawaii, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So together, collectively, 
uh, we all work together to protect this largest uh, marine protected area under the U.S. flag at over 582,000 square miles of land and marine resources. We're slowly getting back there. The one thing you don't want to do is to go too fast towards an aircraft carrier. About 22 meters to go. Yeah, not too bad. Patience is the name of this dive. The Hawaiian word for patience, ho'omanava like, nui. Have you already overflown the flight deck and looked for hazards? No. Thank you. That's part of the, what we're about to do. <laughs> As we avoid them, we're going to look for them. <laughs> yeah. There yeah. hasn't really been anything scary on this wreck yet so far, though. Knock on whatever. Yeah. At least we did the, the perimeter and we're looking inwards. And along the edge, you know, we didn't see anything upwards. Any yeah, kind I mean, of trailing ropes floating up. And it's a flat top, yeah. so... Yeah, this vessel class isn't really known for cables supporting things, right? right. No. Antennas? The only thing Cable that I was worried antennas. about was the uh, tripod, which seems to be missing, so that's fine. That might have actually been missing after the first bomb strike, because there's a photo in the book of it being on fire. Um, so who knows if that was even there when it actually sank. That was an antenna I guess, tripod? I guess I could look. Hmm? That was an antenna tripod? Yeah. Well, no, it was like the tripod that held like a lookout. Ah. Uh, Pro probably radar larger. and stuff too, okay. yeah. Yep. It was pretty big. I mean, it came down where, right <laughs> next to where it should have been. I was like, oh. Uh. It was on top of the tower. It's no longer on top of the tower. You said that supported the crow's nest? So to speak, yeah, there was a lookout up there. Machine gun positions. I'm thinking we're just uh, starting to see the bow in sight there. Yeah, yeah, we got it. For all of its history, Malia, I have to say that for all of its turbulent past, I feel lucky to have gone to Midway a number of times because it's one of the most peaceful places I've ever been. So I've heard. I haven't had the chance to actually uh, get onto the terrestrial portions of Papahanaumokuakea, but I've just heard from colleagues who have been there that it's an incredible place. I know at one time there was a type of tourism um, that was going on but that was kind of um, stopped for a bit do you know a little bit about what occurred then when they were having people fly in on the um, like charter um, planes yeah yeah they could actually stay at the the officers quarters the bachelor's officers quarters the BOQ and you know there was a cost I think an Aloha jet was going up there on a regular basis 
not too frequently. Now I think it's just the uh, fish and wildlife supply flights on the, the on the G2. Uh, there was a catch and release sport fishing operation. There was even a dive shop. And that operated for a while, but it, I don't think it was sustainable as a commercial model. And, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and of course, they tried to be very mindful of impacts to the resources there when they had those things. And I don't know how many people went. I don't know if it was a lot, but it did exist for a little while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know pretty much it's not, um, does not really um, retain a permanent population anymore. We do have teams that go up um, to assess our endangered um, animals such as our uh, Hawaiian monk seals, our green sea turtles, um, and they go up periodically to uh, inventory, assess, and um, help with um, any of the issues or impacts, um, including marine debris. That's a really big problem in Papahanaumokuakea. And all over the Pacific. All over the Pacific. Gets caught up in that Pacific gyre. Oh. Another cool, interesting fact for our viewers is that um, Wisdom is one of the oldest albatross. If you love Laison albatross, you know all about Wisdom. I think she's been um, estimated to be about 68 years old, perhaps, so in that range. Uh, that's just when she was banded. So she could have been a lot, uh, you know, had several years already before being banded. But she is a prolific, a beautiful Laysan albatross that returns to Midway every year to lay her single egg. And um, she has produced a number of offspring. And so wisdom is just one of those iconic um, kind of symbols of um, Papahanaumokuakea and the value of protecting and preserving our natural and cultural resources. I came across one thing at Midway that I've never seen before. And as a historian, you know, I've always enjoyed cemeteries. There's a lot of history in tombstones and, and things like that. And, um, you know, during the, the naval period and, and uh, the Navy's time at Midway, they always had a, a surgeon there. And if someone passed away, that they, they could embalm the body and send them home. But if the surgeon passed away, nobody could embalm the body, so they would bury them. So there's actually a, what's called the surgeon's graveyard of Navy surgeons at Midway. Oh, interesting. Wow, I did not know. I never heard that story before. That's why we love to have our historians on board. <laughs> All this wonderful historical context. It's a little dark. <laughs> That's a little dark, yeah. Like it, is it, it is what it is. It is what it is. It is what it's it real. is. We live, we die. We that do. is the cycle of life. The albatross are so complacent and so <laughs> unused to humans that, you know, they don't get up, they don't move or anything. So before mm -hmm. any flight comes in, you have to carefully go out with a shovel and scoop them off the runway. <laughs> that's fine. Oh, that is that is funny. It's kind of like over on Kauai with all the nene. Yeah. You know, they, they can, you know, they're right there near the airport. So you have to go out. And uh, I know over in Hilo, they actually shoot some kind of um, like noise making device 
to get some of the birds off the runways as well. Oh yeah, yeah, I think that's common at airports. So um, albatross actually, Laison albatross of uh, a lot of whom uh, breed on Midway. We also have our Ka'upu, our black-footed albatross um, that are associated with our god Lono, one of the four major deities in the Hawaiian um, religious system, traditional system. But Laysan albatross are amazing far-ranging birds and uh, pretty much have been tracked um, as they move about the Pacific looking for prey. Uh, which is usually things that float on the surface, like squid, or um, sometimes they'll eat the eggs of the flying fish, the malolo, who lay it in like pieces of pumice that float on the surface of the ocean. Um, one of the problems with them being surface eaters is marine debris and the amount of plastics that they ingest and so that's just one of the problems that we've been seeing with our um, population of albatross throughout the Hawaiian Islands is that ingestion of plastic. So watch the, uh, I think if you're wanting to move down along the starboard side, we could put another move in at this point. Seems like we're settling out a little bit. I think we're looking to go down the midline. Yeah, so yeah, we pretty much want to go up onto the flight deck and go down the midline of the ship. Okay. And we're going to stop once we get to the stack, and we're going to do a attempt to north of mosaic survey and then continue on to the stern. So you want to head straight towards the bow, basically, yep. from here? And then fly right up and over. Okay. Like an albatross? Like an albatross. So, Malia, you were just speaking about uh, human impacts with the marine debris that we're finding and how the albatross are impacted. Uh, we had a viewer that was wondering about the water temperature at the steps and if any of our archaeologists believe that warming ocean temperatures will impact shipwrecks in general, and I'm thinking that it maybe depends on what that ship was made of and how long it's been down there. Yeah, I think at these depths it's going to be fairly stable and won't feel any immediate impacts right away, but certainly for shallower waters above the thermocline, um, you know, anything that leads to warmer temperatures and higher deterioration rates affects shipwrecks, particularly wooden shipwrecks. But what really impacts archaeological coastal sites, and certainly if you understand that natural resources are also cultural resources, here and on the west coast as well, and I'm thinking of the razor clams for the Native American tribes, you know, subsist on them and have a relationship with them. The, the warming temperatures and the greater storm frequencies and increased erosion impact cultural as well as natural resources. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about climate impacts and planning for climate change, you know, we have to consider that it's not just an, uh, a natural resource. Mm -hmm. Humans are part of the ecosystem too. Mm -hmm. And cultural resources will be impacted for both indigenous communities and for archaeologists and historians like ourselves. Jake, do we have access to our CTD data? What's our water temp, like 1.9? Water temp here? Do we have a CTD on Atalanta, listen to SPL? No. Do we have uh, water temp on... Yeah. 
Now we're seeing the bow again. Maybe we can get a second look at the, that angle of the flight deck. And yeah. The, yeah. And it just appeared that way. I, I couldn't swear that it was actually... I think we were all thinking that. Yeah. Bridge nav. Yeah. Call in a ship move, please. Distance 35 meters at bearing 178. Correct, thank you. I guess it could be possible, though. I mean, that's a, a large structure, a heavy flight deck, but it, yeah. it caught the water, like you say, on, on the way down, could have acted like a parachute, had a lot of differential pressure yeah, on it. Yeah, it's a lot of stress on the on the flight deck from the wrong side. Yeah. It's used to getting downward force, not upward force. Yeah. Yeah, it may not have broken any of the struts, but it's just the deck itself might be like a jar. Yeah. We were talking a little earlier about the Chirito worm, the Chirito nivalis, which eats wood. And, you know, the question of does climate change and ocean warming affect resources like shipwrecks? Certainly for wooden resources, they're susceptible to the range of that voracious Chirito nivalis. Mm -hmm. And if waters warm up and, and those, those worms move into areas where they haven't been, the submerged resources that are important to many people. I'm thinking of Viking longboats and then other things like that, and uh, galleons and uh, East India vessels. Mm -hmm. Anything that was submerged in places where that worm wasn't, if the range increases, those are all at threat from that worm. Mm -hmm. It bores into the wood and makes tunnels and, and really decimates the, the ship. Mm -hmm. I think that was one of the reasons they started coppering vessels with yep. sheets of copper in the 18th century is to prevent that. Have you seen any of those impacts to the um, maritime heritage that we have in Papahanao Mokoakiao? Yeah, we see that quite a bit. I mean, uh, there are wonderful historic sites, but the whaling vessels we were looking at uh, with the NOAA archaeologists and, and, and myself for quite a number of years are in, not in good shape. You know, the, the iron is quite corroded and there's very little wood left because it's a, a warm marine environment and a high energy environment. So certainly that, that's led to what those sites look like today. It's led to the site formation of what we see. So would you say it's really important to kind of record and document um, these types of cultural resources so that people in the future will have an understanding of, you know, this, this type of um, transportation, really. Yeah, I, well, I think maritime history is wonderful. So I, I think that... that We're that, asking the wrong that, person. That, that record is, that's right, I'm, I'm biased. But, it, but and you, you know, a lot of sailors and shipwrights, they didn't write down what they did. They just yeah. did it. So mm -hmm. the physical record is the, the rare, unique record. You know, we talk a lot about, you know, preservation and we want to preserve these resources. It's what we often mean by that is preserving the information from the site. Because really it's not practical or pragmatic or that, that, that we could preserve these sites in perpetuity as they are on the bottom of the ocean. The USS Arizona will rust away. Mm -hmm. The USS Yorktown will someday rust away. So we do our best to collect information and preserve that information archive, the images, the history, the memories, all of it, for our understanding and so the future generations can benefit from that bit of history. Mm -hmm. 
We know that these things aren't going to last forever. Nothing ever does in the ocean. It's yes. reclaimed, as we've mentioned before. It's taken back into the ocean. Mm -hmm. That's very well said, Hans. And when we have that understanding that nature, and in this case, Kanaloa, you know, the deity of the ocean, will reclaim and put back to how it was naturally. So as humans, we have to have that understanding that we are not the controllers of the environment, but the environment actually controls us. Have there been any changes noticed um, in the USS Yorktown since it was first located and documented from what we've been seeing on this dive? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Can you repeat that? Yeah. Can y'all hear me a little bit better now? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Uh, sorry, I was asking if uh, we were just speaking about like changes over time with these um, shipwrecks. Have we noticed any changes on this dive since it was first located in 1998? Um, I mean, we, we've noticed different things um, because th that uh, expedition was focused on finding it and, and identifying it. Um, we've come at it knowing where it is, so we were able to take a look more at battle damage and we've, like the torpedo hole and uh, things like the guns being jettisoned and, and certain things like that. Um, I have not seen the footage of only, uh, uh, from 1998. I've only seen a handful of photos, so it's it's kind of a hard question to ask, which is one of the reasons of coming out here. Um, that you know, that data is is on it's in an archive, and I haven't been able to see it. Um, so it's 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 uh, allowing a large number of people on Nautilus Live, all of us, um, to to get to witness this this wreck that um, really only has a couple of photos that that are available right now. And that's the beauty of live stream. And, yeah. um, you know, how OET, um, you know, shares the wonders of exploration with the world, you know, through live stream, through the website that has, you know, just a multitude of resources and lessons and curriculum. So if you're interested in ocean exploration, um, head over to nautiluslive.org. And you can find a, just a plethora of, of wonderful resources for yourself. And if you're a kumu, a teacher, lots of resources for you to share with your students. Nautilus, this is Shore Party. As we get ready to cross over, you know, on, onto the bow, uh, just a quick refresher as we fly over here of potential bomb damage that we may see. We have already seen and documented on the starboard side the delayed action bomb hit near frame 30 that we saw early on in the dive, as well as a delayed action bomb hit on the stack that we first saw when we uh, encountered uh, Yorktown. We also have seen the torpedo damage, one, one of the two torpedo, aerial torpedo hits uh, on the port side. On the main deck, in the forward elevator, there was a delayed bomb hit, and then there was a second delayed bomb hit just aft of the uh, of the midship's elevator, just aft of the uh, of the staff. So that may be where we will see other damage. The only other uh, heavy bomb that went off uh, was aft at the stern, and they said it had left fragment damage, but we saw that, that area was pretty overgrown and occluded so we couldn't see much there but if we don't see anything in the forward elevator according to the after action report the heavy bomb explosion on the flight deck aft of that midship elevator quote opened hole 12 by 12 feet fragment damage on hangar deck so if we can reach after we get to that area and we are close by and we can do the ortho mosaic of the side of the island uh, bridge and stack uh, that may be the only the other major bit of battle damage that would be visible and available to us to expect. Yeah, thanks for uh, for summing that up, Jim. Um, it'll be good to see how um, how apparent those um, patches are, if if at all, uh, compared to. Oh, I'm. 
Yeah, yeah, because they, yes, because they patched it. Yeah, sorry, I'm confusing myself because I've been up all night. <laughs> um, yeah, to see if those patches are visible or have held, or if it's just a hole. So we're looking at a gun position on the port bow of the flight deck? Yep. That was a fun noise. So aloha to all of you joining us live on the exploration vessel Nautilus as we explore the wreck of the USS Yorktown, the Battle of Midway. You can just start to make out that forward edge of the flight deck, that curved edge. And one of the gun positions there, right on the corner on the port bow. Beneath the forward edge of the flight deck, you can see a gun tub. Yeah, we're looking at it now and looking at the plan on two, uh, 20 mil, two 20 millimeter uh, anti-aircraft guns forward in the tub below the flight deck at the bow. But what we are probably looking at here are 50 caliber machine guns, which is earlier weapons are still mounted. Uh, remember, you know, this is early in the war. Northtown didn't have the full complement of this later type of weapons that it proved to be more effective. Right. Uh, and we're mounted on the edge of the But I think that's there should be 250 cows in the corners there and on either side of 20 mil. And that yeah, that looks like a 50 cal. What do you think, Brian? Can you zoom in a little bit? Hans, can, can we get a zoom idea? there? Yeah, I can come in. Thank uh, you. Idea perspective here, how, how wide is this area? How wide is the, the flight deck? No, this area right here, this uh, gun oh. placement. Oh. Is that 10, 15 feet across? Eight, eight ten feet, maybe? Okay, thanks. Come in a little bit more. Oh, look at that. Working look at what the metal is. There you go. Look at that. Yeah. That's a 50 cal. But it, it looks like, looks like it was. It yeah, it looks like they, there might be a but it, barrel pointed right at us. Did you see that? Yeah, heavily, yeah, heavily yeah. corroded. Yeah. Uh, you okay with this zoom, Tito? Uh, actually, we yeah, that's that's perfect. Perfect. Right right here. perspective, and maybe we, get, we go back in. Yeah. That's good, Look thank you. you. Turn my iris down just a little bit if I have any control at yeah. all. Whoa. I've got to say, I never yeah. served in the Navy, but if, if, if I had to man that 50 caliber in that position, I would be feeling a little exposed. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it'd be a little bit breezy, too. Yeah. Uh, it's not a very secure spot. That's 
that's great, guys. That's given us just the view we needed. We really appreciate that. And then you can see down below, you've got the next ones and then in the sub. We are. We are off Fort Bow. And this is the flight deck right in front of us? Yes, it is. Yep, it's the forward leading edge of the flight deck. You can make out the wooden planks almost. Were the flight decks covered in teak? Douglas fir, as we did. Douglas we, fir. I'm surprised to confirm earlier. Yeah. All right, I'm going to throw a little more altitude on here. Remember the battleship had all teak decks. And my goodness, I remember the uh, the deckies scrubbing the decks every day. The Navy Department Library has a copy of the, um, the design specifications that the Navy submitted to the uh, to the shipyards that bid on the uh, CB5 uh, class because they were all built uh, at private yards and uh, the spec. Uh, clearly call for the flight deck structure and be made of uh, of Douglas fir. Um, some people say claim that it was teak, but there's nothing in the specs that say that requires teak. And as we said earlier, you know, you know, first cut, you know, or first early generation Douglas fir is very fine grained and nothing like what you see today. And for anybody getting refitted, if you've done Naval Shipyard, of course, the whole region is surrounded by Douglas mm -hmm. Forest. So, Nautilus, we're, we're good to proceed now over the flight deck at your discretion. Okay, there's about 13 meters left on this particular move, and then maybe we could try to reorient along the center line of the ship. Yeah, that sounds yeah. good. Roger that, and we are actually, Frank just said that you See the planks. They're coming into view. Duck planks. You know, this lighting is pretty good. Do we feel stable enough to do a quick opportunistic zoom here? Yes. All right, copy. I'll try and come in on you down. Now a little bit more. Back to full wide.
Let's see how I fix that stroke. And My eyes must be tired, Mike, because I, I keep thinking I'm, I'm seeing a deformation in the plane of the flight deck, but I, I don't think it, it could be. I mean, it's pretty heavily built, but it's just every now and then I think I see, you know, oh, it just changed its uh, plane of orientation. There's some sort of buckle or bend, but... It also probably looks that way because it's at an angle. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a perspective, particular perspective. I'm disoriented as well. Is the vessel tilting to starboard? Yep. Like Listing, severely? Listing yep. heavily to starboard, yeah. Like 40 degrees maybe? 30? Yep. Okay, thank you. <laughs> it's like, am I looking uphill? Yep. You can see the elevator shaft in the sonar. Yep. That was very distinct. Which we are not going to go into. <laughs> Don't anybody get any ideas? Jim. Yeah, I'm just thinking of a zoom, Mike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not a... Yes. But yes, we did. We did take Bob's ROV in the elevator of Independence. Yeah. 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 And remember, he came up into the, the van and handed out Snickers bars to everybody. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Dang, now I'm hungry. Did you, did you eat that? We have some emergency rations up here if you need them. Hmm. Uh, we should have about 10 meters left in this move. Um, okay. So we are still moving. Yep. No worries. Um, I mean, you can you can continue calling in moves. We're just going to do like a slow crawl across the the flight deck till we get to the stack, and then we'll do something else. So is our objective to move down the sort of center line of the wreck, yeah. or are we aiming for the tower? Well, kind of both. Like the center line, we can kind of see both sides in a way. So just want to move, if you want to move directly towards the stack, we want to be on the inside of it, okay. kind, of, kind of at the base, the forward base of it. Um, and we'll, we'll, we can observe the deck on the way, if, it, if that's more efficient. And we're 40 degrees to starboard and bow deeper than stern. Are we going to be moving up as we go aft? Is that right, Mike? A little bit. Yeah, I think that's right. All right. So when you say the stack, Mike, you mean uh, that's that's the tower where we first started, the first yeah. thing we saw. Yep. Okay. And, and what we're gonna do there is probably run a number of lines going bow to stern, facing the stack and then coming up a couple meters and then doing it back and forth to get a, a photo mosaic survey done with the video. And the stack is on the starboard side, right? Yep. What would be good too... Russ Pat is reminding us all that the angle, the shape, you know, the about the deck it was built into it, and Frank was also, yes, because what, what is the The When the Yorktowns were designed, um, an island structure was still largely experimental, and they had um, the one to balance it, they had to balance the, the weight on the starboard side, so that's, that's why on the port side it goes out a little further, it's just a counterbalance. So wow. you'll also right see the feature on the watch as well. It's the elevator hatch. Yeah, and the stack's over here, right? Yeah. Very nice, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 
when we get back towards the tower, and we, if you see those quads, I think there were four quads, uh, anti-aircraft guns. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna start here. They're, they're pretty here. iconic. I'm gonna start the mosaic here. Yep, and we'll need to, if we can get a sh good shots of those, there's a request. Nav. Uh, ship move, please. Thirty five meters at bearing one nine eight. Correct, thank you. So Mike, this RS is a pretty much uh, rectangular flight deck, right? Without like the modern era having separate Correct. launch and recovery areas. Yep. So Mike, a couple of days ago, you were talking about the historic importance of this particular battle in regards to the fighting being done mostly by air. Yep. Would you be able to share a little bit with our, um, with our viewers who are listening in why that's so um, significant? Yeah, so, um, it, well, if you think about it, aircraft were only invented and, and flight was only invented uh, maybe 30 years before World War II. So, Aircraft development was still really new, um, and all, all battles before then were fought, or naval battles were fought ship to ship, so battleships firing shells at each other, and, um, you know, in World War One, su submarines, the U-boats were, became a threat, and torpedoes, um, so they were, tr they were trying to do things like, you know, torpedo nets and destroyer screens and that sort of thing, um, and even at the beginning of World War Two, like the Aircraft, uh, British aircraft carrier Glorious was sunk by two German um, battleships because it didn't, it wasn't uh, flying with its um, aircraft ready to ready to take off, so it wasn't able to get them uh, airborne. Um, but the the air raid on on Pearl Harbor, um, the, the Japanese are actually trying to take out the U.S. aircraft carriers, and they happen to not be in port. Um, and so it, that kind of initiated the, 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 how aircraft carriers could ex massively expand the range of, of a naval fleet. And the Japanese then um, moved into the South Pacific and took a whole bunch of other islands and sank some other British ships. And then this, so the first engagement between the US and Japanese aircraft carrier fleets was the Battle of Coral Sea where the U.S. damaged the Japanese newer carriers, the Zuikaku and Shokaku, and then uh, they sank Lexington and damaged Yorktown. They actually thought they sank Yorktown. They actually think they, they keep thinking they sink Yorktown. <laughs> um, that's kind of like one of the themes of these stories. And then Midway was, re was really where that came to a head, where it was entirely uh, aircraft. There were no um, ship to ship uh, or even yeah, there were no ship-to-ship -ship engagements uh, in the entire battle. It was fought entirely by aircraft, except for a couple submarines here and there. Um, so it, it really changed how naval warfare was, was fought. Thank you. Thanks for that. So Yorktown seems like it was a very um, indestructible type of ship, if everybody thought it was sunk, but it really wasn't. That's a um, fascinating part of its history. Yeah, it took a lot to sink it. And uh, just real quickly for those of you watching our quads uh, on set feed two on the right. Dr. Michael Brennan 
And then we've got Hans sitting there as well. You guys are on camera for just a moment while I'm searching for something else to put out there. Limited oh, no, choices here. I just think that catwalk would have caught so much water, so much force on the way down. That's why it's canted like that. It just, it, it couldn't withstand that. Yeah. I don't think we've seen much catwalk that wasn't damaged and bent at all. We do have a habit of naming parts of ships after animals. I think that goes back to the Royal Navy. Cats, monkeys in particular, for Europeans. In China, it was dragons. Like the uh, monkey's fist is like that knot? Oh yeah, but there are other parts of the ship. Like yeah. the... Uh, Poop I deck? <laughs> I think they called the... There were trays with indentations, like brass trays to hold cannonballs. I think they, those, they called them monkeys, brass monkeys. Oh. Uh, monkey deck above the bridge on the some monkey vessels. Deck. Yep. So we're looking at wood here, not steel. That's right, wood over steel. I'm trying to orient myself and see where we are. We're looking at the flight deck on the bow. The right, yep. so the, the front of the vessel is to the right, the aft part is to the left, the top part of the screen would be the port or left side of the carrier, the bottom of the screen would be the starboard or right side. Okay, and you said the starboard side is also where the tower is? Yeah. Yeah? Yep. Yeah, so it's going to be on the left in this image. And quite a bit behind the yeah. elevator shaft, right? Yeah, we're not close to it right now. <laughs> we're we're getting there. So 120 meters or so? <clears throat> uh, let's see. Let's see. If you ranged out in the sonar, you might see it. Yeah, it's about 125 meters from us, the tower. This is even slower than you would walk FOD checking the flight line. This is more like a customs, customs line. Yeah.
So a viewer says, man, what a time to be alive. I can have my morning coffee and watch two ROV dives on different parts of the Pacific. Thanks for posting that. It is a wonderful time to be alive. That would be the Okeanos? That would be the Okeanos mm -hmm. over in the Galapagos. I think they're up in Alaska. Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, viewer, they're okay. not in the Galapagos. They're over in the Aleutians, yes? Yeah, yeah. Or, uh, yeah. Gulf yeah. of Alaska. Yeah. There is Schmidt a ship Ocean in the Galapagos. Yeah, oh, it's Schmidt, Schmidt, Schmidt Ocean in the Galapagos. is in the Galapagos. Falkor 2. Oh, so there's three different expeditions going on in the Pacific. Busy. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, um, Ocean Networks Canada is out on the Canadian Coast Guard ship Tully as well. Oh, yeah. nice. There's action going on in Moana Nui Akea. And I have to throw <laughs> this out there, Jason's on Thompson, right off yep. of the uh, coast of uh, Oregon. At Axial Seamount. Uh, they were uh, recovering a node yesterday. Mm -hmm. So it was probably mm -hmm. five or six, mm -hmm. just uh, U.S. and just Canadian, North American. Just start to make out the uh, elevator, I think. On the left? Oh, yeah, there it is. Oh, is it? Yeah. oh there it is. Yeah, I see it. About 20 meters out. <laughs> Not a sure party. It's we just going a little deeper into, uh, no pun intended, uh, the, uh, the question of the bomb hit here in the forward elevator. It, it was a delayed action bomb. It seems to have penetrated at an angle uh, early on in the dive when we were off on the uh, starboard side. We saw damage close to the bow, and that damage is consistent with what the diagrams show in the after action report with that bomb penetrating the forward elevator and detonating on the third deck level, uh, probably at an angle so that the damage is more localized.